Adel, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thanks for having me. I'm calling on your services in multiple videos. People appreciate your generosity when you share your experience and your opinions. Actually, a couple of weeks ago, I came across one of your articles you're talking about, Service Mesh. I will be sharing the link to the article in the description below. Every few years, there's a buzz where there's a new thing that comes in and then people want to jump on it and want to just... They think it's going to solve all their problems, right? Because it's the new yes. shiny thing. Um, but your perspective is actually why you should not <laughs> use service mesh right yes. uh, and 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 this is this is what was super interested for me so let me start by asking you this a, a service mesh does not introduce new functionality to an application so what does service mesh bring to the table very good question i think um from my experience in helping customers, and just for a little bit of context, I am working in this part of Google where we are like the consulting kind of side of Google Cloud, so we can help customers use Google Cloud essentially. And, you know, Istio is like the Google thing. It's a Google project have been around for a while and a lot of people want to use it and people come and it's like, hey, there's this thing called Istio. I heard it has security in the name, so I just kind of, or at least in the description, right? Because if you go into <laughs> istio.io, it says like, Secure, connect, observe. That's like kind of the, the slogan, if you want, right? And um, a lot of times, or a lot of people that I talk to around using Istio or using service mesh in general are ops people, right? They're not necessarily the people who implement the applications. And one of the things I've seen quite often is this like gap between what the developers understand, how the platform is built, and what capabilities are already available there, and what they are actually building, right? And you end up with a situation where uh, basically you are using a service mesh like Istio in, in a limited way. So you don't use all the functionalities just because no one knew these functionalities exist or somebody have already implemented them. Just a very simple one, retries, right? Like you have a, a third party API, you call it, it fails, you have to retry. A lot of people, a developer for developers is a no brainer. It's just going to do like, okay, a little retry library is thingy and then not think about mm -hmm. it again, right? And a lot, a lot of people know that actually a service mesh or Istio can do retries in a simple way with like just a YAML configuration instead of implementing it in the code, right? And so you end up with, basically the way I like to describe it is using a bazooka to kill a bug. <laughs> if you really read the, it's actually funny. If you read the, the CNCF description, it says a service mesh is a set of technologies that allows you to, and I'm just paraphrasing here. I don't remember the exact citation, but it's a, it's a set of technologies that allows you to connect, observe, and secure microservices. Talking a little bit about the history, uh, a serv service mesh showed up a couple of years after containers and Kubernetes, right? So uh, this thing called Docker showed up a few years back, which allows people to just package applications in a very simple way. And then at some point, people started thinking, well, we kind of need to run these containers at scale. So what do we do? So Google came up with Kubernetes. And at some point, people were like, well, when we are at scale, so when you're running thousands and thousands of containers, you need to have an easy way to make them talk to each other, make them discover each other, secure the communication between these containers, observe what's going on, etc. And that's where the whole idea of service mesh came up. You have an infrastructure component. So that's not an application thing. It's an infrastructure component that you deploy on top of typically Kubernetes, most service mesh works for Kubernetes, although you can do service mesh for VMs, but most of the implementations I've seen, I've seen are actually for Kubernetes. And basically it's a layer between the infrastructure, so the virtual machine the container, the container orchestration tool and the application that allows you to the three things, connect. Connect basically is service discovery, make one front end, find the back end, make the card service, find the payment service, things like that. Secure, uh, and when we talk about secure is essentially encrypt the traffic between two microservices without having to implement it in the application itself. And then observe is essentially extract a bunch of metrics that allows you to visualize what your microservices are doing, right? So that's in a very simple way what a service means. So this is kind of the idea. The implementation is... Hey guys, sorry for the interruption. I asked you a few days ago what you wanted on the channel next, and the majority expressed more design and architecture videos. So I thought, why not make it live? 
why not make a live design session where we will be taking a three-tier web application, you know, with a client, a server, and a database, and then we will be converting it into a highly available and a scalable design on AWS using only cloud-native services. This will be a beginner's friendly session. It will be live so I can answer all your questions and it will be completely free. So please pass the word around. Details about when and how to join are in the video description. So make sure to check those out. Now back to our programming. Like it's a very simple, like the implementation is actually leveraging a lot of what Kubernetes already offers out of the box in order to make the idea happen, right? And so in most of service mesh tools, the implementation is typically a control plane, data plane type thing, right? So like Kubernetes, you have the API server is your control plane. You have the nodes are your data plane. So in a service mesh, you also have a control plane and data plane. The, the control plane is typically an extension of the API server. So when you are actually configuring your service mesh, you are still sending the configuration to the API server, which then hands it out to like a controller. And then the data plane is this thing called sidecar. It's basically in Kubernetes world, you are able to take a pod and inside your pod, you have your main container, which is your application. And then you have like an auxiliary container type thing that it's typically called sidecar. It's actually refers to this like, you know, motorbike sidecar three wheel thing, right? During the war. Yeah, exactly. So a sidecar is a container that inside the pod plays an auxiliary role. It helps the main application or the main container do something. So in the case of service mesh, the sidecar is typically a proxy, which sits between the main container of the application and the network. And basically it intercepts all the traffic coming in and out of the application container and implement all the policies that you configure in the control plane. So is it safe to assume that if you want to implement service mesh in your workload, if you want to add service mesh in your workload, you have nothing, you don't have to change anything in the code. It's just the layer that gets added to the infrastructure that intercepts uh, every traffic that is coming outside, like every egress and ingress traffic, and then does, you know, whatever the sidecar is configured to do with it. So there's nothing to, to change in, in the Precisely. code. Precisely. That's the whole premise of a service mesh is that your application container doesn't really care. It just sees there is network interface. I'm talking to the network interface. That's it, right? To take a very simple example of what kind of functionalities a service mesh offers, that would be a whole lot of difficult actually to implement yourself. Let's just talk about the secured component, the secure part, like the secure functionalities. So most service mesh offers this thing called MTLS, Mutual TLS, right? So Mutual TLS is essentially, you know, we have HTTP, then we have HTTPS, which is TLS over HTTP. And that's where a client can verify the identity of server using a certificate and then use the private, uh, the public key to encrypt the traffic. That's the TLS part. MTLS is essentially TLS, but the identity verification happened on both ends. So the server has a certificate, but the client also has a certificate. They are both issued by the same CA, Certificate Authority, right? And both the client and the server are able to verify each other identity talking to the CA. So when a client initiates a call, the client will send his certificate. And then that's, the same, that's what we call the SSL handshake, right? So the client will send certificate. The server will verify the identity of the client before sending its own certificate that the client will verify and then starts the communication over an encrypted channel. So that's mutual TLS. So if you want to do this by yourself, let's say you have two virtual machines, right? Two applications, front end, back end, they talk to each other. Well, you have to just configure your server, which is your back end, to use one certificate. And you also have to configure your front end to use one certificate. And then you have to probably implement this in the code, right? Where is the certificate in which part of the file system it is? And then, you know, what, use whatever library MTLS in whatever programming languages you have and do all of that, that handshake in a way manually, right? Now, if you do this in two VMs, it's probably fun. If you have to do it in a thousand VMs, it's probably not as fun. <laughs> now, if you have to do it in thousands of containers, it's not fun at all. Because once you start doing this, then the next thing you know is your security guys come in and say like, how do you rotate their certificates, right? <laughs> how do you make sure that they <laughs> expire? And then when they are expired, the client and the server get issued new certificates without having to restart the workloads, right? And this is a functionality that most service mesh gives you out of the box. You install the service mesh, you inject the sidecar, so you add the sidecar to your containers and you just turn on one feature and never think about it. The service mesh has its own CA, right? When a pod, 
when application pod, so your application is coming up, the sidecar comes up as well. It will talk to the control plane. The control plane talks to the CA, issues a certificate to the sidecar, and the certificate sits in the sidecar. It's not in the application pod. The pod doesn't care. The application will continue talking HTTP or gRPC. But when it sends traffic to the sidecar, the sidecar will take that packet and then encapsulate it in a, in a TLS protected. So it will encrypt it, send it to the other side where there is another sidecar that will take that traffic, remove the certificates and send traffic to the receiving end in HTTP format. And if tomorrow you decide to bring in a new service, well, guess what? You know, your sidecar is going to act and behave the same way. Because that's, that's the thing this service to service communication you know that's exactly what makes microservices possible and the real world um a microservices application it, it's not the five minutes get start tutorial that you can find like in in a real world workload you need to think about security you know you need to think about scaling these services you need to think about uh, accounting for everything that is um, latency, uh, throttling, you know, monitoring, tracing, uh, fault injection, disaster recovery, like a ton of these things that are maybe inherently um, network related, right? So if we can assign these things to a sidecar and don't even think about them anymore, right? That's 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 pretty much the promise. But then you come and you say. No, don't use service mesh. <laughs> yeah, so it's, it's, it's right? a paradoxical situation, right? Uh, All right. So the, that's what I want to explore with you. Yeah, so the promise is quite good. So the promise of what a sidecar or what a service mesh can do is is on paper is really nice, right? Okay, what? Why, why wouldn't I want my services to talk MTLS to each other, right? On paper, the, the, the promise in terms of functionality is, in, is great. But at the end of the day, it is a third, it, another tool you have to install. It is a tool you have to maintain, patch, upgrade, monitor, make sure it works, debug when it doesn't work. So there is a lot of engineering cycles that will go into maintaining this tool that a lot of people, in my opinion, doesn't actually think about too much. They just think about, as you said, the five, to five minute start, quick, quick start guide. Hey, just apply this YAML file to your Kubernetes cluster. Make sure that this namespace has a bunch of pods running on it. Label, that's how you do sidecar injection in S2. You just put a label on namespace, start your pods, and that's it, right? That's it works, right? Magic happens. <laughs> yeah, magic happens, exactly. Um, now, if you want to do some sort of, you know, traffic shifting or, um, as you said, like a fault injection, oh, you just write this very simple YAML file, you send it to the API server, and that's it. Like the, the sidecars will take care of all of that. Well, that's great. But there are a few things you have to think about. First of all, um, and a service mesh with all its sidecars and all its control plane comes with a pretty hefty footprint on your environment. They need CPU cycles and memory to run, right? So one of actually downsides of Istio, one of the problems with Istio that I have came across multiple times is that the bigger the service mesh is, the more pods th th there is in service mesh, the more beefy your sidecars become. And the reason for that is very simple. It's because in an Istio environment, uh, and, and I wrote this in the article, there is no, technically there is no load balancing, right? When you have two services talking to each other in an Istio environment, right? Let's say you have a front end and back end, and front end has 10 replicas, so 10 pods, and the back end has 20, right? So each of these pods have an IP address. And typically in a Kubernetes environment, what you would do is you would deploy your, your back end, then you would create a service of type cluster IP because your traffic is internal, so you don't have to expose it to the internet. And then you would configure the front end to just discover the back end using this FQDN, right? The built-in Kubernetes DNS. Great. Now, normally that cluster IP is a virtual IP that Kubernetes creates for you. The front end will call that virtual IP and then the traffic will be route robin load balanced across the 20 pods, which are the back end. So that's in a typical Kubernetes environment how it works. In a service mesh environment, that's not how it works you still use the Kubernetes built-in DNS system to do service discovery. So the front end will still use the FQDN of the backend to find the backend, right? But the communication doesn't happen through the virtual IP. It's the 10 sidecars of the front end talking to the 20 sidecars of the backend. We know one thing about Kubernetes is that when you have two containers in the same pod, they share the same IP. So one of the things Istio does is that whenever you add a new service to the cluster, which is part of the mesh, 
it will go to all the existing sidecars and update the routing table. A routing table is an in-memory thing where basically every single sidecar knows how to reach every other sin single sidecar in the mesh. And it knows it by IP address, right? Mm -hmm. So as you can imagine, this table will just keep growing and growing as your service mesh becomes bigger and bigger. Your sidecar will just need more resources because it needs memory to keep all these routing tables. And there is no such there is no such thing as partial upgrades updates so far. So there is no such thing. So if I would have to implement it myself, I would probably have some built-in intelligent thing that updates the routing table only of the of the services that talk to each other frequently, right? Uh huh. Some kind of caching mechanism. You push the most frequent things to the front, and then everything. Mm -hmm. Exactly. So if you have a front end and the back end, and they're talking to each other from metrics, you know that these services talk to each other. So it makes sense that in the front end you have the routing table of the back end, and that you update it as the back end scales up and down. But if the front end never talks to the payment service, well, there is no point of keeping the routing table of the payment service in the front end. But then we are introducing what we call cold starts in case at some point the front end talks to the payment service. And that's, well, that's the kind of like a, a price to pay for having mm -hmm. a smaller footprint. So it's like mm -hmm. a kind of trade-off that you have to make. But that's not the case today. In Istio, at least it's not the case, right? So there is this problem of front prints. Like your services, as your mesh is getting bigger, like your sidecar containers have to be bigger in terms of memory, at least memory consumption. So you have to actually estimate what is that footprint of the sidecars compared to the actual footprint of my application? And I have came across a couple of use cases where Istio with all its sidecars was kind of two times the amount of resources that the microservices themselves are consuming, which is like crazy, right? It is. So we're just exchanging one set of problems with another set of problems. We haven't solved actually anything. We just created exactly. more load. But... New problem. <laughs> but actually now it's... It's, it's another team who's solving this type of problem. Now it's the ops team, it's not the dev team, right? So we freed some cycles. Anyways, I'm just joking. <laughs> so the footprint is one problem. The second problem is a pure skill thing, right? Like, do you actually understand what this thing does? Do you know mm -hmm. how to debug it when it breaks? Like, the devil is always in the detail. Like, it's all, you know, nice and rainbows and roses when you install it and it works. But when you have traffic, live traffic going through your website and things get broken, and they your always business do. owner, exactly. And your business owners are yelling at you, like, why is my website dying during Black Friday, Cyber Monday? Then you have a problem at your hand. If you don't understand how to debug it, you're not going to know how to solve it, right? So that's a second problem. A third problem, in my opinion, is what I call, or I called in my article, the supporting infrastructure. Like, if you deploy a service mesh, you know that one of the things it gives you, or one of the functionalities, is observability and tracing eventually. So you would need a bunch of tools to deploy to be able to take advantage of those metrics. So you probably need Prometheus, you probably need Grafana, you need some sort of tracing tool like Yager or whatever, some tracing GUI. These things don't install themselves. You have to install them. Yep, and manage them and maintain them and upgrade them and secure them and... Exactly. And so you have all these hurdles to sort of jump over before you ever get to the point where you deploy Istio and you enable MTLS, which is kind of the bare bone functionality you will want to have. And then the next thing, which are argued in my article is, are you actually doing a good job in your organization exposing the details of your infrastructure to the developers so that before they write code, they go and see if that actually exists out of the box so they don't have to do it. Say I am a startup and I'm thinking about implementing service mesh. What is what is at what stage of the development life, life cycle should I start, you know, thinking about service mesh? Is it easy to add a service mesh uh, architecture once the product is up and running in production? Or is it actually better uh, and easier to start thinking from the get go, you know, and build an application that would use service mesh? So very good question. Um, in theory, most service mesh tools make it look easy to just bring an existing infrastructure into a service mesh, right? If you're in the greenfield situation, I think it's much easier to just go over what are your requirements? What, what do you actually need to do? If, for example, and let's take a hypothetical example, you are a fintech and one of your requirements is encryption over the wire, a service mesh is a very appealing tool, 
because it gives you encryption over the wire without the hassle of managing certificates. Why wouldn't you want to do that, right? So maybe start with the requirement. Like, what, do, do I have in my field to meet certain requirements, certain security requirements, certain uh, maybe traffic management requirements? Do I have to, um, I don't know, do I have to figure out that when people come from an Android, I have to send them to one backend. When they come from an iOS, I have to send them to a different backend. When they come from Chrome OS, I have to send them to a third backend, right? That's one thing that Istio can do, which is this thing called traffic steering, right, based on headers. So you can figure out what's the agent from the header of the request and then send them to different parts of the system. So that's one, th that a service mesh in this case would be great because otherwise what you will have to do is build an API gateway that analyzes the headers <laughs> and then, you know, based on the header, we'll route the traffic and then you have an API gateway in the middle, which is usually a single point of failure. Well, unless you use a managed one, but that's a different discussion. So that's one, so start with requirements. Like what are we, what are, what am I actually supposed to be doing? And if some of your requirements could be made easier to match with a service mesh, it's a great tool. Then the second question is like, do I actually have enough skill set in my team to manage this thing? Do people that work for me understand what the service mesh I'm adopting does, whether it's Istio, Linkerd, Console, whatever, right? Um, so that's another thing. That's another question actually you have to ask. Then you have all this footprint supporting tools problem you have to solve, but most people are already used to kind of like estimate how much I need. It's like how much kind of terms of resources I need to do some capacity planning, for example. So that would be that like for a greenfield, I think it's easier. For an existing application, one of the main problems that I have came across is, is your tool actually compatible with service mesh? <laughs> like Istio can only support TCP traffic. If your application is UDP, it doesn't work. It's like one basic problem, right? Um, another one I came across, I can give you a very specific example. I, uh, so Argo is a very similar to Airflow. It's like a software that you install on top of Kubernetes and it has like this very nice GUI. You write your code, which does some data transformation and then you can trigger your code based on events, right? I see. So Argo, it's like, it's like step functions, for example, for AWS. You can say like, I have a, I don't know, a pub sub topic, an event come through. I will just take that data, take it, start up a pod. The pod will execute a bunch of transformation on the data, spit out the results, and then die. So Argo is sort of the control plane that can allow you to do this orchestration, right? And so the way Argo works is that it has a control plane inside Kubernetes, and then when it executes jobs, it just starts pods, and the pod will execute your code. The problem, one of the problems I, I, I met with, with, with uh, is using Istio with Argo was that while Argo can start a pod, execute the workload, or the data transformation and die in 30 seconds, when you add Istio, it becomes like three minutes. <laughs> because the sidecar needs to be up first Correct. before your main compute start doing Correct. anything. And so for this kind of like tools like Argo, like Jenkins, like CSS, like CSD pipeline is pretty much the same idea. For these tools that are not long running, so it's not a backend, it's not an API, it's not a microservice. It's a thing that just starts a job, executes something and then dies a service mesh will introduce a whole lot of overhead <laughs> into the whole process. I can right. see why. Yes. So that's, in this case, for example, it becomes counterproductive Pretty to much. use service, regardless of all the advantages that it brings. Some companies, they have what we call a tooling teams or a tooling team. So a, a team that actually takes care of building tools for other developers to use, right? Within a company, is it the tooling team that should take care of maintaining that sidecar? Is it developers themselves who should start, you know, building that sidecar and maintaining it and upgrading it and whatever? Who do you think should be the maintainer of the sidecar that is used across the company? Well, in a very ideal scenario, you want to just hand that off to a cloud provider and let them do all of that stuff for you, right? <laughs> yeah. All right, managed. Yeah, so yeah, managed. And by the way, like Google is one of the few cloud providers that offers a managed uh, Istio. The that's Anthos, that's for Anthos, right? Anthos Service Mesh yeah. is essentially a managed Istio. And it, there is also a managed data plane. So we're coming up with a new feature where we're managing also the sidecar for you. So you don't have to do anything, right? That's that's what I would like. Google has the Anthos service mesh. AWS has uh, EKS app mesh. And these cloud providers, when you look at it, they make you think that it's as simple as clicking on a button and deploying app mesh or service mesh. And I wanted to ask you, is it actually that simple? It is pretty simple. I've used the managed version 
multiple times, it's actually way easier than deploying the thing yourself. yourself. And actually one of the things you get is you also get like very fast response to security problems when you use a managed software, right? So like is 2 itself, if you look at is 2 itself, it's actually not only one tool, it's two components. The control plane of is 2 itself, the is 2 d uh, container, and then you have the um, Envoy, which is a sidecar. And Envoy is a third party open source software that was developed by Lyft, right? Yeah, so, that's pretty cool. So you are actually using two different pieces of software. So the question becomes, it's like, what if there is a vulnerability in one of these things? Well, how fast can we discover it and how fast can we fix it? We typically, when you use a managed software, the cloud providers are typically on top of their, their game, right? So like a vulnerability is discovered, a patch comes out very quickly and usually, hey, just roll out a new version, restart your workloads and not, not never think about it again, right? As a developer, I shouldn't really care that there is a, soft, a service mesh there. For me, it should be like, I write my application, it talks HTTP, I don't care, right? That's, that's all I should. Well, I don't care up to the point where I am trying to implement something that already exists. That's a different problem that we have to talk about, right? Why, why did we start at the beginning talking about this, like using a bazooka to kill um, uh, a bug? It's because actually both service mesh tools comes with a lot of functionalities that are beyond just the MTLS security thing, right? Um, there is a lot of, like Istio has really great traffic shifting capabilities. You can do a lot of canary deployments, you can do blue green, you can do uh, you can shift or steer traffic based on certain headers. Um, you can actually do uh, uh, end user authentication with GWT directly in the sidecar, so your application doesn't have to to take care of that. You can do service to service authorization. It's actually a great tool to use. It's typically referred to as like the zero trust model, where um, it's like you can basically ensure that two microservices that talk to each other are only the ones that need to talk to each other. And Istio allows you to, with that, with this mechanism called authorization policies, it allows you to go all the way down to even the kind of HTTP call that is allowed. So you can say that this, it, it, it kind of functions as a firewall where you are setting up an incoming firewall on a service that says only this service with this specific service account, so with an identity, can talk to me and they can only issue get calls and only on slash API slash V1. So you can even define a specific path, right? So if your microservice has like a wide API, you can narrow down which API each call caller can make. So that's one thing that 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 is basically sort of what people do typically in an API gateway, right? Because by the way, this is like a like a lot of times, it's just a different thing. I think you should write an article about it. A lot of times when people talk <laughs> <Please> about, <do. laughs> a lot of times when people talk about API gateway, they tend to think that API gateway is this thing you set up in your environment for north-south traffic, so coming from outside into your environment. But a lot of very useful API gateway stuff can do, be done east-west, so between your microservices, right? And so a lot of times people do implement certain functionalities that service mesh gives you in an API gateway. Traffic shifting, traffic steering, um, load by, so blue green, stuff like that. But you can just do that in service mesh directly. That reminds me about a reminds me of a, a service called Ambassador, which is basically a, an ingress controller, right? And, and it does a little bit more. But Istio also, or service mesh, do uh, does also this ingress controller stuff. Yeah, so ingress gateways are for north-south traffic, so coming from outside to inside. Istio also have something called egress gateways, so from calls initiated from inside the service mesh to outside. So you can route the mesh, you can route the traffic through a specific set of proxies, which does some policies, apply policies on the, on the traffic. But east-west, essentially, you don't really need a gateway in, in between microservices because that's what the sidecar does. That's the whole point of the sidecar. You can just configure policies that says, okay, this microservice can talk to this microservice only on this specific path with this specific HTTP call. A, a very simple example is a canary, right? Like you have a front end, a back end, you roll out version 1.2 of your back end, and you want to do a canary with like 1090. So you can say like, okay, if the front end does 90% traffic to version 1.1 mm -hmm. and then 10% to version 1.2. And actually one of the cool things with the sidecar is that when you say 90, 10, you are actually sure that 90, exactly 90% 90 of the calls, <laughs> because that's essentially what the sidecar does. It will just start a counter that is like a call number one, call number two, all the way until nine goes to version 1.1, and then the 10th call goes to version 1.2. So, so that's kind of one of the 
kind of accurate traffic steering in a way or traffic shifting you can do. Um, you can do retries, we talked about it. So um, this is actually especially useful if you're making calls to outside. So you're talking to like a third party payment API that has rate limiting. You don't have to have your main container thread stuck waiting for this API to come back. You can just hand that off to the sidecar and let the sidecar retry. And then you can even implement like, okay, retry five times with like 10 or incremental wait time. So 10 seconds, 20 seconds, 25 seconds, etc. Yeah, so it's like an exponential backup. Exactly. And then when after five calls, if they don't go through, then maybe you trigger an alert somewhere that says like, okay. Circuit breaker or... Exactly. So this kind of things that people use to implement in code, you can just hand it off to a sidecar with like a very simple YAML file, right? Um, so all of these functionalities are back to the, in, what we talked initially is, are your developer actually aware that this thing can be done in the service mesh so they don't have to implement it in the code? This is a, this is a super important discussion. And I find myself also, you know, talking about it also uh, during my time at AWS with, with a lot of companies and especially uh, not for the case of Istio, but for the case of step functions and, and, uh, and state machines. For example, in the case of AWS, the AWS step functions offer a lot of um, native resources, whether you want to do, as you mentioned, exponential backups, whether you want to implement, uh, whether you want to send an error to a DLQ, whether you want to uh, uh, handle timeouts, whether you want to, but people need to be aware of those yes. in order to use them. And when you are aware of those, it actually, make your code super slim, super simple, and you go from writing 20 Lambda functions to actually writing four or five, and just let the machine itself, let the system itself handles that for you, right? Code is not an asset. Code is a liability. The more code you write, the more problems you will have, the more bugs you will have to fix, the more thing you, things you will need to review. So the fewer lines of code you write, the better it is. But why I said it's it's a different discussion because I think as engineers, as software engineers, sometimes we fall into the trap of getting attached to our code. And, and it's like, I wrote it, it's mine, you know, and 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 we get proud of our code. And an advice, uh, if there are any juniors, you know, watching this uh, and people thinking about becoming software engineers, Code is not yours. The code is the company's. <laughs> it's actually the company that owns the code, regardless whether you wrote it, whether you were on, on a weekend, whether it's on your machine, whether on whatever. Every line of code belongs to the company, you know? Uh, the ego has to stop at the door. The code belongs to the whole team. And so um, the fewer lines of code you write, the better everyone will be happy. Your manager will be happy, your team will be happy, and you will be happy and you will focus on writing you know, solving the real problem. And also, I mean, the, I mean, just from a, from a pure mathematical perspective, the more cycles you spend on writing network code, so code to handle network problems, the less time you're spending implementing business functionalities. And networking is not sexy, right? Yeah, no, networking no is tough, stuff, stuff, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and I mean, no one, yeah. So like the, the less you have to handle infrastructure problems in the code itself, like what happens if the network is not available what happens if I'm not able to resolve this DNS thing? What happens if whatever problem, like like this is typically like if else type scenarios, the less you have to do this, the better it's gonna be in general. So I think from from an ops perspective, the, the more you can leverage whatever the service mesh gives you out of the box, the better it is. If there are some metrics that comes out of the service mesh, use those, you don't have to implement those things yourself. You don't have to ask your developers to expose certain metrics in the app itself. If network metrics, um, you know, fail calls metrics, things like how many 200 calls, how many 400, how many 500 calls have been going through. If these things can come out of the sidecar, just use those, right? You don't have to, to try to fix problems that doesn't exist essentially. Uh, uh, service mesh actually gives you tracing out of the box. It's actually a pretty, um, neat tool, um, and just to remind people, tracing is this idea that you can able you are able to basically pass a header from one microservice to another as they are handling requests. So you are able to visualize for every single request that comes in how long it takes each microservice to process it. Right. So if you can get this out of the service mesh, which Istio does, just use it. Right. It's great. 
a lot of service mesh tools comes with out of the box graph tools. They can allow you to just install a GUI, spin it up, and it tells you who is talking to whom. That's typically one problem that a lot of ops prop teams have to solve. Like, I'm a visual person. Yeah, I would love to see that. Yeah, exactly. Definitely. Like in a microservice, because like in a container based environment like Kubernetes, good luck understanding who is talking to who. <laughs> Like you have to deploy some network debugging tool and run some trace routes to try to understand what's going on. Um, if you can get this in a visual way, why not, right? You have to take into account that you have to deploy some infrastructure to allow you to do this, maintain it over time, etc., etc. Also, you have to spend quite a lot of time understanding how to debug a service mesh because it is an extra layer on top of your of your platform that if it fails, it fails drastically and you have to understand how to figure out where is the problem. From a developer's perspective, I think it's as simple as go into the damn tool documentation and try to figure out what can it do. Like, can it do something that you don't have to write code for? And if yes, then go bother your ops team and tell them, hey, please write, please submit this YAML file for my service. <laughs> or maybe you don't even have to do that. If you if you have a CICD pipeline that can allow you to, like typically on Kubernetes, um, the most service mesh tools allow you to configure the service mesh using YAML files similar to how you deploy the application itself, right? And a lot of times when you are on a Kubernetes environment, your CICD pipeline is building containers, right? Hosting them in a container registry somewhere and then triggering a rollback on the, or a rollout on the deployment. So it's basically deploying YAML files. So you can just add the YAML files for the service mesh to your existing pipeline, right? And it will be just executed for you, deployed, assuming you have permissions, and, you know, the service mesh will be configured for you. So just try to figure out what that thing can do. It's one of the things that I actually see in a gap when I transferred from working in an internal engineering team toward actually working in cloud was this major gap I see between like how companies do stuff and how companies, how Google does stuff. So at Google, you can get mm -hmm. developer, a software engineer, you hire them, and basically they are production from day one. They have everything figured out for them. They have the thing to write code there. They have basically Git or whatever we use. They have the thing to deploy. They have Borg. They have monitoring out of the box. They have everything is ready. You don't really have to care. You can write your RPC service on day one. I Then you go talk to third party companies, external companies, and they're like, oh, they're still discussing GitHub Enterprise and Jenkins. And, you know, and they have to discuss I, I know. every single microservice that comes up, right? So... So the more you can make your developers productive and make them aware of what the thing, and also access to information is in, inside Google is quite 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 easy. You can just open documentation and understand like what Borg does, how to use it, um, like, like what capabilities exist there. If you can make that information available to your developers, it's good, right? Like, hey guys, this is what we're using. Maybe write a one page thing that describes the architecture of the system, what components exist, and then maybe with sublinks to sub documentation that says, okay, this is what issue does. This is how you can configure it. This is an example how you can configure it. Um, this is what this other tool does, you know, like some internal thing. Cause like a lot of times when you give people external links, they just don't check them, right? <laughs> yeah, we're, we're all guilty of that. Yeah, I know. Exactly. I mean, why why spend five minutes reading a documentation if I can spend five, five hours just banging my head exactly. when trying to fix it. <laughs> so one, one, one example I've seen, sorry to, to just quickly, one example I've seen with a customer actually where their adoption of service mesh was successful, or oh, it's the customer in Sweden, um, was that they had every Friday a one hour lunch time thing where teams come up on stage and they talk about something they have built. And it was all around the service mesh thing. Right? It was all about, we didn't have the service mesh, now we have it, what problems this thing have helped us to solve. So team would come up and they would go like, well, hey, we're the tooling team, this is what we're using service mesh for, and this is what it allows us to do. It's an open invitation meeting, it was like, a, like an amphitheater type thing. Everybody's welcome to come, grab your lunch, come and then listen to people talk. And this kind of information exchange creates a dynamic where somebody would sit, have lunch, look at a slide and they go like, oh, we have that same problem. I'm just, now, now I know who to talk to. So kind of this internal showcasing thing, I think works very well. 
regardless of whether you're adopting service mesh or not, it's just in general, right? In my experience, companies who adopt these kind of things, like in the company I work right now, we call it university, the Essence University. Some companies at AWS, we used to call it lunch and learn. So yeah, in my experience, companies who adopt this kind of democratizing and sharing the knowledge, uh, they have way better chances actually of adopting these kind of things. And um, one question, I get asked a lot, honestly. Mm -hmm. If I am using the same sidecar to handle everything communication with all my pods, mm -hmm. isn't this a single point of failure? If there's a problem with that service that handles the sidecar, doesn't that mean that pretty much everything is kaput, everything is, is down. Say I am updating the sidecar and now the new version of the sidecar is rolling out to all the other instances that are running. And so at some point, all my sidecars are having this faulty uh, instance. Then you have a problem. <laughs> and that's hopefully, and then hopefully you have done a good job in making your rollout gradual, right? Mm -hmm. um, so in, in the case of Istio, it comes out with a canary release mechanism. Essentially, the way it works is that you... So again, quickly, when you deploy Istio, this, the control plane of Istio is deployed in a namespace called Istio system by default. You can change the name if you want. Uh, and then the sidecars are deployed wherever you have a label that says automatic sidecar injection enabled, right? So you label namespaces. So what you can do is you can deploy a new release of Istio. So that basically means it will deploy a new Istio system namespace with like Istio system dash something. So it's different from the existing one. So you are running like a two side car, two, two control planes type thing. And then you go to each namespace and then you just change the label to point to the, to the new release. And then you just roll out. So you restart your pods. So basically the pods will die and they will come up with the new version of the sidecar because it's injected by the new control plane. And then they will talk to the new control plane, not to the old one. The two control planes also talk to each other because in theory, if you have two control planes, it's like you have two service meshes, <laughs> but in practice, it's like just one big service mesh, right? Yes. So that your migrated workloads can still talk to your not yet migrated workloads. And so hopefully this rollout is done in a gradual way where you are moving one namespace at a time. Got it. So that now I don't know if that answers the question. Oh, it does. It does. I mean, um, also I would add and use a managed service mesh, yeah. <laughs> so you don't have to think about these kind of things. Yeah. Um, now, in conclusion, give me your recommendations to a successful service mesh deployment and operation. And operation. What are maybe some steps you can think of? You know, uh, advice, tips. What are your recommendations? Yes. So I would say step number one is have a good understanding of what that specific service mesh you're adopting can do beyond the, it's give us security, beyond the just very simple, like very simple functionalities because all of them can do security, all of them can do MTLS. So beyond that, what can it do? So have a good understanding for that and maybe have a good plan for how can you leverage those services over time. I am not, so the article, if somebody would read the article, they would probably argue, they would probably think I'm arguing that you shouldn't use service mesh at all. And that was not the whole point. The whole point was raising all these questions about like what you should think about. As in my opinion, one of the things you should talk about is like, okay, this thing can do this functionality, this functionality, this functionality, this functionality. And probably day one, I'm gonna use the security part, but I have a plan in one year to also leverage observability. And I have a plan in two years to leverage traffic steering, traffic shifting, blah, blah, blah. So have like a great understanding of how are you going to adopt those features over time. So you don't end up with, you know, killing a bazooka, killing a bug with a bazooka. So that's one thing. Um, the second thing is have a good understanding of your capacity planning uh, needs in the beginning. What is the footprint of this thing? How much is going to need to run? by itself, but also how much all these auxiliary pieces of infrastructure I need will require, right? In terms of footprint, in terms of cost maybe, and in terms of engineering hours, right? The third thing is make sure your team really understand what they're doing, right? Like really spend time going through documentation, debugging, probably even installing things, screwing them up and try to fix them, right? Because the last thing you want is surprises. 
When you say team, you mean ops team, developers team, or both? DevOps team, so whoever runs your things 24 hours, whoever is your 24 hours 7 team, essentially. The next thing would be, yeah, the next thing is test your application. So do an MVP, make sure your application is not going to be, is not going to have degraded performance because you introduce service mesh, right? Maybe it's because of increased latency. Again, don't forget there is like a thing that intercept traffic, right? So it's not, it's, it's a perceived latency. It could be a few milliseconds, but it's probably matters for your specific use case, right? Um, so make sure to test it, write a simple application, write a very simple microservice, deploy it, deploy a microservice and just run a test on it. The other thing, and this is actually a general advice I would give if you are going down the path of Kubernetes pods, containers, microservices in general, um, it's one thing that I have been doing with customers quite a lot is um, have a setup, have a, like an environment which you are able to bring up an, an exact copy of a production environment in an automated way, maybe through Terraform or something, deploy your application to it, but this new environment should be based on the new versions of the software you are not using. So if you are on Kubernetes 121.2, deploy Kubernetes 1.23. If you are on Istio 1.12, deploy Istio 1.13. Whatever is that next unreleased beta feature, whatever thing, have an automated system, a pipeline that once a day, multiple times a day, doesn't matter, will just bring up an ephemeral environment, build all your applications, deploy them, make sure everything works and then destroy it. And that's actually a great way to actually catch regressions in the changes in infrastructure, right? Because Kubernetes is all API based, Istio is all API based, while well, maybe the 1.13 Istio is deprecating an API that somebody is using. So maybe this new, next version of Istio will deprecate certain APIs, right? So you have to be able to catch those problems before they occur and before you go into your console and click upgrade, right? So, so this is something we've done with the bank where we basically, once per day or twice per, twice per day with it, we have like a whole thing that just set up a whole copy of the existing infrastructure. So all the clusters, everything takes the latest snapshot of the code, so whatever people push to their repository, build all the containers, deploy them. If something fails, we would just like stop and alert so that somebody can go and look what, what happened. If everything goes well, we just destroy everything and then never think about it. I was just gonna say, and that's why having a scriptable, reproducible infrastructure, it's super mandatory. Of course. It's super important. Of course. And it has to be exactly the same copy of your production environment. Great, Abdel. Thank you very much, my friend. Uh, it's always a pleasure to have you here. Keep writing those articles of yours. Uh, I will. I'd love to have you. <laughs> I will keep sharing my opinions. In the feed. <laughs> please do, please do, and keep sharing them with us. Um, how about people who want to connect with you? Where can they find you? Twitter or LinkedIn. Bored Abdel on Twitter, B-O-R-E-D-A-B-D-E-L, uh, or just look me up, Abdel Feta, uh, on, uh, on LinkedIn and you can just DM me on any of those platforms. Super, I'll add those links in the description as well. Thank you very much and uh, talk to you soon, my friend. Thank you. Ciao.